So this lecture is about chapter 16, and we're going to be talking about um, evolution, and we're going to be talking about Charles Darwin, and there is going to be some um, historical uh, points going on here. But um, this is an introduction to evolution. And this is a picture of uh, Chuck himself. That's Charles Darwin right there. So um, evolution and its core principles, it's a central theme in biology, and it explains the similarities and differences in much of what we are able to see. The theory of evolution stitches together many of the ideas that we have about life and living organisms and why we all kind of look like one another and why we have different characteristics that are similar to these other things. So the core principles of evolution, here, here they are. All life is linked through a common ancestor. We, we all have common ancestry going back to the beginnings of life. Okay, that is the first principle. And the second is the populations of living things change through time. They evolve to match their environmental influences. Um, this change, which is driven by natural selection, makes it so that advantageous traits are selected over less advantageous traits. So for instance, if you are for like say living on an island where there are a bunch of, um, let's say you're a bird and you're living in the Galapagos, some kind of finch maybe, and you, your, your particular island has a whole bunch of nuts that are really hard to crack, but you need to get at those. You're probably going to develop a larger beak over time so that you are more able to get at the nutrients provided to those provided by those nuts. But let's say you, uh, a close family member nearby on a different island doesn't have those nuts. For whatever reason, that tree doesn't grow there, and all you can eat is bugs. You're going to develop a smaller beak so that you can actually go after those bugs and get the nutrients provided by them. So let's go through this again. All life is linked to a common ancestor. Populations change through time. The environment influences where you are influences this change so that advantageous traits are um, seen more often. Um, and they become more common in the population. This is descent through modification. If you are living on that island, you're a beak with a, or you're, you're a beak, you're a bird with a big beak, you're going to do better, you're going to reproduce more, more of your offspring are going to be there because you're able to get more nutrients, and you're going to become more common. So, um, Darwin's contribution um, to the, basically the little story of evolution that we have is, he set uh, sail on the HMS Beagle. He was um, planning on studying um, religion and philosophy, but he decided to be a naturalist and take some time and go on this two-year journey um, around the world. And um, he found that this rich diversity of tropical life. He's from England, and so you can't see a lot of tropical life in England. Um, but as he's going through and seeing these islands in the, in the tropics, it made a really deep impression on um, Darwin, who was probably 22 years old, I think, during this time, so maybe a little bit older than, than most of you guys. Um, and so this is the map of his journey. They set sail here. They went down around the, the Horn, down around South America, and they continued on and circumnavigated, um, visiting Australia for a while, coming back around, going around the, the Horn of Africa and returning to um, London uh, several years later. So aside from, you know, his incredible journey, and I totally glossed over it there, there's a lot of really interesting details. We'll talk about a few of them. Uh, but there, there's a lot of really interesting stuff. I would recommend reading some of the literature available, like um, uh, Voyage of the Beagle or any, any of those books um, by Darwin or about Darwin. Um, but because of these, basically Darwin was set up by a few different people, and I'd like you to kind of know their names, and I would like you to know what it is that, or how it is that they influenced Darwin. So there was this guy named Lyle who talked about these principles of um, geology and talked about kind of how old the earth is. Um, so getting to this idea that the earth is actually very, very old and it isn't this young thing. And he also talked about that it was continuously reshaped. Um, and so this, this helped Darwin to uh, arrive at his uh, theory of evolution. So Lyle was the geology guy. 
Um, and he looked at these, these various rock strata and he looked at different fossils. Um, and he was able to sort of figure out, like I was saying, that the Earth is actually quite old and constantly reshaping itself, as we know now. Um, the other person uh, who influenced Darwin was a biologist named Lamarck. Um, and Lamarck kind of suggested that inheritance of traits were things that people acquired during their lifetime. Okay, uh, so the idea here being that if, if I go to the gym and I start lifting weights and I lift weights for you know many years and then I have kids, my kids will be born more muscular. And that is of course preposterous um, you, you know, you guys should know if you lift weights, your child is not going to be born with, with muscle, all right? He also was reading this gentleman named Cuvier, was a French gentleman, and Cuvier was suggested that um, species are becoming extinct, which was kind of a revolutionary thing. Remember, this is over 150 years ago. Um, but Cuvier suggested that many species become extinct. Uh, he wasn't really right about the mechanisms by which those things become extinct. Um, but those are names I'd like you to know. Lamarck and his idea, so a classical Lamarckian evolution idea is that giraffes have really long necks because their parents spent a long time trying to reach up into the trees. Cuvier was uh, saying that species actually do wind up going extinct. And so <laughs> here's this, this is a Lamarckian evolution idea. Lamarck would say that duck's feet developed to be the way that they are because ducks spend a lot of time in the water flapping their feet around and so that just causes their feet um, to ultimately become webbed which you know you should understand is ridiculous because if you spent all of your time in the water your feet would not become webbed even if you had um, generations of people who spend most of their time in the water their feet are not suddenly gonna just become webbed you know overnight or from generation to generation. So like I was saying earlier, Darwin took this tour of the Galapagos Islands and he was, you know, amazed by the incredible diversity that he found there. And that's why I was referencing those finches earlier, because he encounters these finches and he sees that they're similar to the ones that they have on the mainland. He said he sees that they're similar, but they're different in certain ways. And so he said maybe island species are actually derived from those mainland species and have become different over time because of the different environments that they encounter on different islands. And that is, in fact, what happened. Those finches are all from mainland populations. Uh, he took several samples of finches back to London and took them to a bird expert and said, hey, what kind of birds are these? And the guy said, oh, well, these are all finches. And Darwin was like, how can this be? They're all so different because they're involving or they've evolved to um, be suited to whatever island it is that they were living on. And here's a picture of an adorable Galapagos uh, tortoise right here. Um, and this is a picture of just sort of what the Galapagos Islands um, look like. And they definitely inspired Darwin. They were a big part of his um, figuring out uh, these evolutionary ideas. So another person that Darwin was reading about was this idea of, by Malthus. So Malthus was saying that there are actually limits to how large a population of organisms can grow. And this should make sense to you because there's only a certain amount of resources available to any population in any given area. Um, so Malthus is another important name and I didn't highlight him here, but I would like you to know Wallace as well. Wallace had a very similar idea to Darwin and Darwin read it. Darwin had been sitting on his idea. He didn't know if he wanted to publish it or not. He, you know, he thought maybe he would just take it to his grave with him. And then Wallace publishes, publishes a similar idea and this causes Darwin to actually come out with his idea of the theory of evolution. And he and Wallace actually co-published a paper. So Darwin's thesis that living things um, evolve over time in response to natural forces is accepted at the time by scientists about 15 years after the publication of his book. Um, advances in genetics through the 20th century, so people like Hunt, this is people like Gregor Mendel, who actually lived around the same time as Darwin. Um, this is people um, like Hershey and Chase. Um, there's lots of people in, who are involved in, in 
uh, the discovery of genetics, but those ideas completely um, vindicated Darwin's original theory of evolution. So, um, but there is still a lot of opposition to evolutionary theory. Um, it feels like every single day I read articles about um, people challenging it. Um, and this is actually not as true anymore. People are coming up with new, more creative ways to challenge the theory of evolution. I think most people by now understand that a scientific theory is a, um, a well-studied thing that has been confirmed many, many times by many, many different lines of experimentation. But every single day, people call this theory into question, um, usually without actually understanding its ramifications and its underpinnings. So because of its historical nature, some of the evidence for evolution cannot be demonstrated um, experimentally. And that's what a lot of people go off of. And they say, well, you, you, know, you can't prove every single aspect of it. So then it must not be true, <laughs> which is, you know, again, pretty preposterous. Just because you can't prove every single aspect of it, the 95% the of it that you can prove experimentally, and the fact that that other 5% is absolutely logical does not mean um, that it's untrue somehow. So um, evidence derived from many sources, um, embryology, biochemistry, geology, nuclear chemistry have all done nothing but support the theory of evolution. And all of these have been um, demonstrated experimentally for more than 100 years. So we're going to go now through some of the evidences for evolution. So rock strata data, um, you can actually look at the radioactive decay and figure out how old these different layers of rocks are. Also, rock strata are set up in a way that makes logical sense. The newest rock strata are on top. If you go down 20 meters, you're going to find much older rock strata data. That should make sense, right? And as you go deeper into the soil, oh, lo and behold, the older the rocks get. Um, there's also fossil evidence. So fossils of uh, simpler organisms are found in older rocks, which should make sense. If you go back further in the evolutionary timescale, things tend to get more um, primitive or, or um, older, more ancestral. Um, but if you go back to um, 500 million years ago, you're not finding primates because they didn't evolve yet. And so um, rock strata data and fossil evidence are some of the most compelling lines of evidence for evolution. So here's a trilobite. This is a, you know, several, I forget how many, maybe 100 million years old. I, I don't remember. I should look it up before I say that. But here's a trilobite, very well preserved in the fossil record. This organism does not currently exist today. And there are many lines of evidence that tell you how old it actually is. So. Um, the other, the next line of evidence here is comparative morphology and embryology. So different structures um, in the early development of all animal embryos. So uh, all animal embryos in early development look very, very similar to one another. And as they develop, they look, they they begin to look different, which is a pretty good. Um, pretty good evidence for common ancestry. We all look like one another when we're early in development, and then we ultimately differentiate um, later on. So here's an example of some um, homologies. So remember from lab, homologies are things that look similar to one another because of common ancestry. And you can see these, these bones are all pretty much set up the same way. You, you have similar bones in all of these areas in these very, very, very different creatures. These are all mammals, sure, but you all you wind up with the same exact patterns um, of ossification. You wind up with the same exact um, bone patterns in all of these things. So comparative morphology, another pretty strong line of evidence. Um, and sort of the more uh, modern version of evolutionary proofs are genetics. So advances in molecular biology have shown us that there are cellular control systems like Sonic the Hedgehog genes that, are, that exist in pretty much most higher organisms, everything from a fruit fly um, to a mouse. You also have the cytochrome C oxidase gene, 
uh, which is present in most higher organisms. That's what is helping you. Um, this is a mitochondrial gene that's helping you to make ATP. Um, the rate of accumulation of gene mutations since the split from the common ancestor may want, allow one to deduce how long ago two groups of organisms diverged from each other, use of a molecular clock. So what that means is you say humans and chimps are related to each other. Based on fossil evidence, we're going to say our most recent common ancestor is, I, I, I don't know, we'll, we'll say we have evidence for one that's 100 million years old. I'm just spitballing here. That's, not, that's probably not accurate. You can go back and say, well, humans have mutations in their DNA this often, and chimps have mutations in their DNA about this often, and you can actually trace those pieces of evidence back and say, wow, humans and chimps have this many differences in their DNA. That points to a most recent common ancestor of about 100 million years ago. So again, evolution has been confirmed yet again by these modern techniques. Um, you can also use those um, modern text techniques, like I was saying, to show the differences. Remember, this is a phylogeny like we showed in class uh, today, but this is actually using um, the cytochrome C oxidase gene. It's using one particular gene, and it's showing you the differences between these different organisms. So humans and pigs have 13 differences on that gene, and you can see they're quite closely related to one another. Humans and ducks have 17 differences, and they're still pretty close, but not quite as close. Uh, humans and snakes have 20, and I think this is implying that ducks and snakes have only three, so they're, they're closely related. Human and a tuna has 31, so they're still related, but definitely not as close. And a human and a moth have 36, so moths are still on here. And if you get down to the very, very simple organisms like yeast, which still have a cytochrome C oxidase gene, which is kind of wild and another very compelling evidence for evolution. There are 66 differences between the human and yeast gene at this, at, um, on that particular gene. So experimental evidence can demonstrate natural selection at work. That would be like Endler's experiments with guppies. Basically what he did is he took guppies and he put them in different conditions. Sometimes he'd put them in with a whole bunch of predators. Sometimes he would put them in with different predators and it would absolutely drive though that population of guppies to change physically what they looked like or what the males amongst them look like. So if there's a bunch of population, a bunch of predators, the males are going to be not super colorful. If there aren't very many predators, the males are going to be very colorful. Um, they're going to be uh, very conspicuous, very obvious. So interestingly, uh, there is good evidence for uh, the evolution of human skin color. So if you are from regions that are further, uh, further north, your body is not going to be getting as much sunlight. So if you're from further north, you're not going to be getting as much sunlight. And so your skin tends to become lighter because you're further away from the equator. You're getting lighter so that your body can absorb as much sunlight as you can so you can get all of that vitamin D. Whereas if you, are, if you live toward the equator, you're having a lot more direct sunlight all the time. And so your skin is going to be darker um, because you can still get the vitamin D, even though you're having that sunlight get blocked by um, getting blocked by your pigment, you're still able to get vitamin C because you have lots of sunshine. So this is all stuff I just uh, explained, so I'm just going to skip over this and get to this figure here. If you live in this region, you probably have darker skin. If you live in this region, you maybe still have slightly darker skin, but it's going to be um, pretty light. And then if you get up into here, um, like these European countries, you're going to have probably even lighter skin because you don't have enough sunlight throughout most of the year.